Good morning. So I'd like to welcome you to the final plenary session and the last day of 2014 REC. Before I make a few closing remarks and offer a few final housekeeping notes, I'd like to invite Vince Kildoff up to say a word about the upcoming NARS annual workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hi, I'm Vince Kildoff from the NARS Board of Directors. Um, on behalf of the uh, NARS president, Michael Bono, uh, I want to thank OPRE for the opportunity to invite you all to attend the 54th Annual uh, Workshop uh, and Research Academy that NARS is holding. The uh, slide shows the dates, August 17th to the 20th. And, we're, uh, and that we're back on the East Coast this year in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, you also see our theme there, putting the pieces together. Uh, the NARS Program Committee, co-chaired by George Falco of the New York State uh, Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, and Heather Hahn of the Urban Institute, are currently fine-tuning this year's program for you. Uh, we appreciate the presentation proposals we've received this year, um, so a number of them from people in this room. Thank you. Uh, and Michael and I also want to thank official sponsor, Public Consulting Group, for their support. Uh, our web address is on the slide, and I'll also have some cards out there at the registration desk. Um, if you haven't had the opportunity to attend in the last uh, few years, I urge you to check out our past programs that are on the site. Um, in closing, just we look forward to uh, you joining us uh, at the NARS workshop this year for a robust program and uh, many fruitful discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. So I hope that you have all enjoyed the last two days of productive conversation and networking. To me, the REC plays many roles. It highlights and charts the progress of ongoing research. It stimulates ideas for future research. It provides a forum for peers to network and learn from one another. And it offers a dedicated time and space away from the usual work routine to reflect on the broad field of research and practice our work collectively operates in. Over the last 17 years, REC has grown considerably in length in terms of time, in size in terms of participants, and in depth in terms of content and issue areas addressed. REC continues its evolution as we move to a biannual schedule. As the late Maya Angelou said, all great achievements require time. So I'm confident this additional time will allow REC to continue to fill its many roles in a meaningful and high quality way. So a few housekeeping points before we move on to our last plenary session. The conference evaluation is available online and will also be sent uh, to your inbox. We really do take conference feedback seriously, especially now as we're transitioning to a biannual schedule and have some flexibility to make changes. So I hope you will take the time to let us know your thoughts. Conference presentations are available by request. Just send a message to the email address found throughout your program book. And videos of live stream sessions will be available online, online later this year. Just check back to our website. As we've been saying throughout the conference, please stay connected. On the back of cover of your program book, you can see a variety of ways to keep in touch with us through Twitter and LinkedIn, by joining the OPRE listserv, and by visiting the REC and OPRE websites. Last, I'd just like to take a moment to thank those who have made this REC the successful convening it has been. Thank you to the Grand Hyatt Hotel staff, who has done an excellent job of taking care of us this week. Thank you to ESI, our, contract, our conference contractor, who has done an amazing job at coordinating this conference and making sure we all knew where we needed to be when. Their good work and expert assistance assures everything runs smoothly, and we're truly appreciative of that. And lastly, thank you to all of you, both to those who are present in this room and to those who are joining us virtually. 
Your participation is what fuels this conference and makes it worthwhile. We look forward to continuing the conversation and seeing you again in 2016. So with that, I'd like to invite our panelists up for the last plenary, including our session moder moderator, Rebecca Maynard. Dr. Maynard is the University Trustee Chair Professor of Education and Social Policy at the University of Pennsylvania. She's a leading expert in the design and conduct of randomized control trials in the areas of welfare and education policy. She has directed numerous large-scale evaluations of welfare policies and practices, home visiting programs, education reforms, and employment and training programs. She's also been a leader in the development and application of methods for conducting systematic reviews of evidence on program effectiveness. She holds a BA in economics from the University of Connecticut and a PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her, her full bio, as well as the bios of all of our panelists, are available on our website. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Um, thank you. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here this morning. We have uh, one more panelist. Uh, Don, where are you? Yeah, I think we... Uh, um, okay, well, let me... I'm going to uh, start, the, start the introduction so we stay on time. This is a really exciting uh, plenary session. I want to welcome you. We are going to talk about how to build reliable evidence to inform policy and practice. Um, we're going to be treated to a conversation among a group of individuals who have been at the task of building and using reliable evidence to inform policy um, for many years, as signaled by the subtitle of this session, which is Lessons from 40 Years of Welfare Research. So you may wonder why we're still all up here walking around and uh, um, talking to you today. But um, now more than ever, the public is demanding evidence that its tax dollars are being well spent. And moreover, we have growing needs and shrinking budgets, um, which are increasing the importance of being highly strategic in how we invest our scarce resources to improve the health and welfare of our citizens. But good strategy re requires that evidence about the likely returns on these investments that we're making uh, be available to us. And this morning's plenary is about the journey that brought us to the point where experiments are increasingly looked to first in the quest for evidence on what works and what doesn't work and how well. Um, we're also going to hear about the challenges that are still before us as we seek to improve policies and practices based on this kind of evidence. So we have um, four panelists and we hope that we will have a fifth commenter by the end of the session. Um, you have full bios on these distinguished individuals. Uh, uh, on, online and in your packet. So I'm going to be brief because I want us to spend the time on the conversation, which I think is going to be very, um, very interesting for you. Um, Judy Garan uh, is President Emerita of MDRC, and she was a pioneer in the field of experimentation with social welfare programs, and has probably done more than any other person uh, to create a norm of using experiments to address questions of cause and effect. And Judy recently co-authored a book with a second panelist, Howard Ralston, um, that chronicles the 40-year history of the conduct and use of experiments in social welfare. And Howard is a, a principal associate at APT Associates, and he was a former longtime administrator at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Our third panelist is Ron Haskins, who is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, uh, but who spent um, a d very distinguished career as a senior staff uh, member and staff director of the House Ways and Means Subcommittee on Human Resources. Um, fourth, uh, we are, are treated by, to have Don Winstead with us. Uh, he is presently principal of Don Winstead Consulting in Tallahassee, Florida. But Don has wor done work across all levels of public service, um, being caseworker in his early uh, years in, in the profession and working up to senior positions in state and federal government, including serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services. Our fifth uh, panelist, whom we hope will be joining us, uh, 
Um, in offering some concluding remarks is Mark Greenberg, who is Acting Assistant Secretary for the Administration of Children and Families. And Mark sent his regrets late last evening that he is uh, not going to be here early this morning because he has been called up to the Hill for some very um, important work that uh, you all can, uh, you know what that is like. So hopefully Mark will be here and be able to join in the um, final uh, part of the discussion. Um, and then following the uh, conversation among the panelists, uh, we're going to have 15 to 20 minutes to um, let the audience engage with these uh, distinguished um, individuals. Um, now, I want to remind you that the session is being uh, live streamed. So um, we, we do have some people who will be uh, participating um, in, in that way. And we will be, be able to invite those of you who are watching us, not in this room, uh, to participate in the Q&A at the end. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to the panelists. And I want to sort of begin the conversation um, talking about why um, randomized experiments have been sustained over this 40-year period. Why, why, why have we been able to keep this car on the rails here? Uh, I'm going to ask Judy to kick us off here. Okay, it's on. Um, there's many reasons, and I'm going to highlight five. The first is the interest in evidence. Forty years ago, welfare, called AFDC, was an unpopular, open-ended entitlement program funded in part by the federal government and in part by the states. And as states got increasing flexibility in starting in 1981 under Ronald Reagan, to redesign the program, both the feds and the states were interested in learning, did reforms increase work, reduce welfare, cost, or save money? Now, those are the types of questions that call for determining if reforms led to changes in behavior over and above what would have happened due to normal economic changes or the behavior of people interested in getting off the rolls. The second is evidence of the unique value of random assignment studies in answering those questions. As these 40 years unfolded, it was increasingly clear that random assignment studies first were feasible, legal, ethical, and the most reliable way to answer those kinds of questions. At the same time, it became increasingly clear that alternatives fell short and could provide misleading information on who benefited or what programs were effective, including the normal statistics that welfare administrators looked at, things like how many people got a job or how many people left the rolls. Could they figure out from su such numbers how much was due to the economy or the program? Third, the actions of state administrators. State administrators stepped forward to volunteer and, in some cases, seek out participation in such studies. And in some cases, particularly the gentleman sitting over here, Don Winstead, um, fighting to defend it uh, when such studies were under attack. In the book Howard and I wrote, your colleagues in the states are really the heroes of the story. Later, there was a prodding by HHS and OMB that, who insisted that random assignment studies were the quid pro quo for getting waivers to welfare policy. But at the beginning, in the first five and maybe even 10 years, the interest was getting truth. And this was the way to do it. Fourth, money. Evaluations cost money. And especially prior to 1996, uh, welfare studies benefited from two uh, unusual factors. First was the peculiarity in the AFDC law that basically put up federal matching money for every dollar. Uh, they put up a dollar in an open-ended basis for federal research. And the second was actions of the Ford Foundation to take on studies of more less popular or really to keep such studies alive when the federal government didn't, didn't choose to. Fifth point, this momentum was sustained by several factors. A first was a growing community of supporters, state legislators, congressional staff, 
OMB, state officials, client advocates like Mark Greenberg at the time, and a small number and then ultimately a growing number of academics who believed that this was the way to find out whether social programs were effective. Second, that the people who really believed in such work and fought for it in HHS, in OMB, in MDRC, and other research firms stayed in their jobs for the 30-year period, uh, sometime the 40-year period we're talking about, and therefore could sustain the focus on what we needed to learn and the importance of doing it well. And finally, evidence that these studies, not just because of some gimmick, random assignment, but because they addressed important issues and that the results were replicated in state after state in varied real-world contexts proved to be uniquely convincing and had an unusual impact on policy and practice. So the evidence that they were useful and used created a positive feedback loop for doing more studies. Howard, what you were in the trenches all that time. No, I, I think Judy has done a wonderful job, you know, summarizing the key points. I, I would just expand on on one thing that uh, that she mentioned that I think was really crucial, and that was the kind of the acceptance and the support of the the broader policy and uh, and practice community, so that people really came to s expect to see findings uh, portrayed in a certain kind of way. They began to look for experimental evidence. Uh, and that, I think, has to do with a really key part of why experiments are so powerful beyond their, their power of their rigor to produce reliable evidence, and that's their transparency. It's not like people were asked to sort of believe a statistician that this was the right way to interpret the data. That the transparency of the results, a kind of, you know, it's, we know underneath it's more complicated, but basically a simple comparison of a group that was exposed to the program and a randomly assigned group that was not. And I think that, in that sense, the method along with presentation of those results really created a, uh, a powerful force within the broader community of not just researchers, but of policymakers, practitioners, and that that uh, it was really critical to why things were able to be sustained and why they had such a big influence. So let's, you know, let's move on and talk a little bit about the, you know, the way in which this um, actually worked in the states and in the, uh, in the federal government. Did the research influence legislation, policy, and practice? Um, Don, why don't you? Well, based on the experience that we had in Florida, uh, first of all, the, the clear answer is yes, uh, and, uh, in, but in a couple of ways. Uh, and our first experience with a large uh, random assignment evaluation was a, uh, a project in Florida called Project Independence. Uh, my colleague Judy Moon, who's in the room, was uh, a key part of, of that implementation uh, in Florida also. Uh, this was an evaluation that was conducted by MDRC. Uh, there uh, were participants selected in, in nine counties that were randomly selected to be representative of the state of Florida, and then the uh, participants uh, were subject to random assignment, and uh, over 18,000 uh, participants were involved uh, in the overall evaluation. Importantly, it was, it was not a waiver program, so we didn't do it because Howard made us, uh, but we, uh, we did it because we thought it was important to answer uh, the key questions about program effectiveness, and also because both the state agency and the Auditor General had tried to answer that question non-experimentally, and all we ended up with was controversy about whose findings were right, uh, and I suspect that uh, the answer was none of those findings were correct uh, based on what we later learned. 
when uh, Judy made reference to some of the controversy in Florida, and let me briefly quote uh, from uh, Judy and Howard's book, she said the, the challenge of selling random assignment in California, which had some challenges too, proved a tepid warm up for what happened next in Florida, where the toxic combination of gubernatorial politics, a concerned state legislator, an ill-considered decision in a separate study, referencing, I think, the Texas uh, child care uh, study, fed an explosion of inflammatory press that almost led the state legislature to ban control groups and in the process both jeopardize a major federal research project and potentially poison the well for future studies. So the first contribution, I think, was by convincing the Florida legislature uh, and Judy Garone did uh, dozens of mini tutorials, one-on-one uh, -on -one with legislators on the importance of this research. And by convincing the Florida legislature that this was a legitimate and correct way to look at these issues, I think the, the first important contribution was not to derail uh, the research going forward. Also, a, a key finding of the project independence evaluation was a difference between an early, early cohort and a later cohort in term, that had uh, different access to child care because of budget constraints and found that the, uh, the early cohort with access to child care had su significantly better impacts uh, than a later cohort. This really led to uh, the design of a later demonstration in Florida, the Family Transition Program, uh, which was the, one of the first uh, time-limited welfare reform demonstrations, which was a, a waiver program. And the project independence findings really informed the design of the Family Transition Program, uh, and particularly the importance of transitional benefits there we were able to document that transitional benefits like an enhanced uh, earnings disregard, higher asset limits, uh, et cetera, produced a positive result, result in uh, employment and earnings and also did not cost more in terms of welfare payments, that the fact that more people went to work actually reduced welfare payments relative to the control group this then, by having that information, uh, and some of which from a state database that we, we used, we were able to then justify uh, the design in going statewide in the, uh, the TANF program when that was implemented in 1996. So you could draw a direct line between the findings of the project independence uh, evaluation to the family transition uh, evaluation to the design of Florida's uh, statewide TANF program. And I think because of the results that came out of the Family Transition Program and the focus on that, a lot of states who were interested in things like enhanced earnings disregards and, and uh, different asset limits uh, and strong work requirements looked to Florida as being at least one of the models uh, for things that they would think about in their TANF program. Uh, so I think in that way, it not only directly led to the design of, of Florida's program today, but without the evidence from the, uh, the random assignment evaluation, we would never have been able to prove the case uh, to the appropriators in Florida for them to uh, see that not only uh, was this a better way to go, but it was also a cost-effective way to go. So... What do you say to the, to the um, smart <clears throat> econometrician who comes in and says, I've got, an, I've got another, another way to show you? I mean, did, did, <clears throat> I mean, did, did that not happen? Uh, well, we, um, we have some smart econometricians in Florida. Uh, and we also have some econometricians. I, I mean, we, uh, uh, and uh, the, in fact, some of the early findings, uh, th both that the state agency uh, did and, and that the Auditor General did, and the Auditor General hired a, a professor from a local university to do some uh, economic modeling. Uh, and so a lot of that mod modeling was done 
but all it led to was controversy and claims and counterclaims in a political environment where people had a very pronounced political stake in the outcome. And so anything that, that left wiggle room and room for debate produced debate. And the, uh, the findings uh, from both the, the project independence evaluation and the uh, family transition program evaluation were seen by people on both sides of the political debate as being authoritative and as being, and so there, there was still some controversy about what to do, but there wasn't uh, any lingering controversy about the evidence base on which those decisions were made. So from where you sat, Ron, what, is, what did this look like? Okay, I first want to clarify uh, that what I know about this stuff, I, I didn't actually experience this 40 years ago, and I wasn't even born yet. But these other elderly <laughs> panel members have informed me, so I can really talk, talk about real stories that they've told me about. So I want to clarify that. We, we, we've got the, we, the age elderly, discrepancy you know? is noted. Um, hey, let me make a distinction. Uh, there are people like the people on this panel uh, who read studies, and they are really extremely aware of random assignment. And I would say, I wouldn't doubt it on this panel, I know all, all of them personally, that they would say that unless it's been demonstrated by a random assignment, it hasn't been demonstrated. And even the National Academies has taken that position in a, in a recent uh, report. So, but that was not the case back then, and plus members of Congress do not read research reports generally. So the, what, what I think happened was that the whole series of, uh, of experiments that the states ran, and 41 states had uh, even if Florida didn't, other states got waivers. And I think by the time we passed welfare reform in 96, 40 states or 41 states had actually done uh, experiments, the majority of which I think were random assignment. Howard could correct me on that if he wants to. But so what happened was that a kind of a atmosphere developed that the members of Congress who had never read a study and probably could not define random assignment came to believe that what works is work. And, of course, that was the heart of the debate that Republicans said, we can make people work. They want to work. They will work. We just have to arrange things the right way. So we've got to punish them if they don't, because some people are going to respond to punishment. And we're going to help them find jobs, so that's a positive thing. And we're going to make sure work pays. That was the goal of the president. So I think it was this, the way of developing an atmosphere that people do want to work. They will work if you set it up right. And not only that. But an MTRC study and other studies showed you could actually save money. In fact, Don described a situation like that. And boy, that's music to the ears of anybody in a legislature. They love that. Uh, so I think it was this more general sense. So my answer is yes. I think that the, the research definitely influenced the policy. And it can continue to do so today. I hope we have time on this panel to talk about it. I think the situation's changed a lot now. I think there are many staffers in Congress and even members of Congress who are well aware of random assignment, and a lot of them easily say evidence-based policy. So I think we've had kind of a revolution, we should talk about this more later, uh, on evidence-based policy, and it's moved off in a lot of different directions. And this administration, I think, is the most evidence-based administration ever. They've done more to push evidence-based policy. But it all started with welfare reform, random assignment, the role of MDRC and Mathematica and APT and the other companies. Uh, so yes, it had a big influence on legislation. And I believe that it'll have even bigger influence on legislation in the years ahead. I? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, one comment, uh, and Ron mentioned the, the National Academy. And I think one of the things that was part of the debate in, in Florida, part of the, the discussion, that I, I, I think the story would be with, uh, incomplete without acknowledging the, the, uh, uh, the ro role of uh, Rob Hollister. Yeah. That uh, uh, Rob Hollister uh, chaired the, the National Academy uh, panel on youth employment programs and the, the studies that had been done in Florida uh, before Project Independence, uh, we, uh, uh, Judy kind of helped us get in touch with, uh, with Rob and sent those studies to him and asked for his uh, judgment. Uh, and he wrote back and, and uh, was uh, 
fairly direct in his assessment uh, of the value of the studies that we had done and then laid out uh, really the, the methodological case for why uh, those approaches were not valid and what we needed to do. We presented uh, that information from Dr. Hollister to, the, uh, to an oversight committee of the Florida Senate, and they became convinced uh, because of the case that he laid out th uh, of the way that we should go forward. And so I think that uh, Hollister's uh, kind of um, description of the, the, uh, the importance of the work and also the methodologies involved uh, in a way that uh, the Florida Senate uh, could understand and accept was a real important part of what developed in Florida. Can, can you or, or Judy, uh, in, in a nutshell, sort of recap what, what it was that Hollister said that, that really was convincing? First, I would just say that Hollister was almost a voice in the wilderness in academia. Academics were late to this table, to this feast, if you will. There were a few who sang this song, but most academics, um, led by very powerful, statistically trained and leaders in the econometric field, felt that they could conquer this subject through complex statistical analysis and really thought that random assignment was not necessary. Over these years, they failed. They fa and Becca was one of the early analysts who looked at um, an early experiment and showed that the effort to do this statistically would not lead you to the right answer. So what Hollister looked at in the late 70s were a plethora of youth, youth studies launched under a 1977 law um, you know, maybe a billion dollars was spent on innovative programs and evaluations, or close to it, 500, in real dollar, those were, you know, big dollars, weighty dollars. Yeah, 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 those were, that was a lot of money. And at the end, when the National Academy of Sciences got together, they said they really couldn't figure out whether all these fabricated comparison groups were, were, were t showing you what people would have done without the intervention. That they, they couldn't sort out whether the comparison group was really the same and therefore gave you an honest answer by saying what would have happened had people not been in the program or differed in unmeasured ways such as motivation or where they were located or the context in which they were living. Um, and people, uh, as Don said, couldn't reach a solid conclusion. They, this thing is called selection bias. Are they biased in some way, those studies? So the panel, the National Academy of Sciences panel um, and report in 85, and it was really a landmark. It was clung to by those of us defending these studies, said um, we can't reach a conclusion for those studies. And at the same time, the Department of Labor, which had funded many studies of employment and training, programs pulled together a panel that concluded that with tens of millions of dollars studied, there was not one number they could defend before Congress. That's really bleak. You don't want to go down that road again. And I think those kinds of, uh, those two landmark studies, the Department of Labor and the National Academy, just changed the whole direction of this work. So, Ron, just yes. a brief comment. It picks up on my theme of how much things have changed. Uh, the scholarly world certainly was not didn't play an important role in developing this movement we're de describing here. And one of the greatest examples is education. I can remember a, a report from the National Academies that described uh, the field of educational research as the vast wasteland of educational research. They actually said something along the lines, we know hardly anything about education and effective practices and so forth because they do junky studies if they do studies at all. So the creation of the National Institute of Education Science in the early 2000s under President Bush uh, and required by previous legislation, so it was bipartisan, is really a big turning point. And I don't think it would ever happen, and it wouldn't have had the support, and almost everybody associated with played some role in the welfare reform experiments, or at least knew them very well. So now we've, we've really had an, a revolution in ed education research, and random, we have many random assignment studies have already been reported and are going on now, and we're gradually beginning 
I think it's like building a mountain out of pebbles. We're gradually beginning to accumulate evidence from random assignment studies about reading, about math, about all sorts of things, and it's because, and Becca's kind of grinning because she was an important member of the National Institute of Education Sciences, uh, and it is really one of the great institutions in America and continues to do spectacular work, and as a result, we're learning, and I don't think any of that could have happened without the welfare reform uh, history that we're describing here. So there must be something that these experiments can't tell us. There must be things they tell us and tell us well and things they don't tell us so well. So I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about that because I'm, I'm confident that there, if we did nothing but experiments, we wouldn't sort of get to the end game where we want to be. Uh, Howard, do you want to kick us off sure. on this? Uh, I'm going to begin by very quickly reading a list of things we've learned. It's not a, a complete list, which would take too much time. And I'm going to read it quickly because I think a lot of people here are familiar with this, but mostly because my main purpose is to show uh, how many things we learned and how, and how many things we learned in, in how many different dif dimensions. So I'm going to do this fast. Okay, work first programs that include job search, increased employment and earnings, and reduced welfare. Programs focused on basic education also did, but their effects were typically smaller. The education focused programs were also more expensive. With a few exceptions, effects were largest at about two to three years after people entered the program and declined to zero by five to seven years. The size of effects varied somewhat, but they were remarkably similar across individuals and more and less disadvantaged. By themselves, the work first and basic education programs typically fail to move family income up or down, uh, as earnings increases were offset by welfare decreases. Wage subsidies combined with work requirements did increase family income, but only while the subsidies were in effect. Positive effects for wage subsidies typically were larger for those with weaker employment, expected employment outcomes. In the absence of wage subsidies, programs had no pattern of effects on young children. Subsidies produced positive effects on school outcomes for these children while they were in effect. There are indications of negative effects on adolescents in all types of programs. Earnings impacts were bigger in better econo economies, which was not a foregone conclusion. With very few exceptions, programs focused on increasing employment retention, especially those that use case managers to help deal with employment issues, have not been successful. Well, there is some indication that wage subsidies have been. So, I mean, that's a lot of information. There are few fields, I think, where you would get so many people, you know, the consensus of, uh, you know, and mo almost everybody would agree with those things. So if we've answered a lot of questions well, what haven't we answered so well? And I want to talk about three different areas because I think they illustrate different kinds of uh, points. One area where I think we didn't answer questions so well was related to the value of occupational skills training for low-income mothers. And there were some very good studies of that, so I don't want to say that there, we learned nothing but they were very limited compared to the studies that we had on uh, related to either basic education or uh, to, uh, to job search. So I think that's an area where more work uh, certainly can be done. But a second reason not only was the work more limited in their area, I mean, it was partly limited because a lot of women on welfare couldn't get into occupational skills trainings programs. And that, along with other research and other experience, really led to new approaches, to real innovation in trying to overcome some of these uh, limitations that were observed in earlier studies of occupational skills training. So I think you have an example here where th there weren't as many studies and the world changed a lot. Another area I want to talk about is the area of providing subsidized employment to individuals, which sometimes now called transitional jobs, goes under a lot of different names. And here's a case where 20 years ago, I think we could have, uh, there would have been a, les a lesson on the list. And the lesson was from uh, four or five very good experiments that women who participated in uh, employment subsidy, wage subsidy 
uh, sorry, <laughs> subsidized jobs, sorry, um, that uh, it increased their longer term earnings. Uh, more recent studies have been fewer, but they've been negative. They don't show that. Uh, so I think one of the lessons from that is that um, the world changes. I, I personally think one of the way in which the world changed here is that uh, low wage women have lots more work experience than they did when the studies were done. And it's harder to increment that experiment, experience by putting somebody in a subsidized job. That's a hypothesis. But I think this is another area where I think the world changing suggests if, if we're going to pursue this strategy, we need to find more effective ways of applying it. A third area which uh, illustrates another thing is we learned a lot about job search. And uh, we learned that it was highly effective. Uh, but we learned about it most frequently in the context of being combined with something else, especially in a lot of the later uh, studies. So that our best studies of which forms of job search are better than other forms of job search. So job search is now ubiquitous and related to you know, TANF. Uh, but if we want to understand which forms work better, we really have to go back to studies that were done in the 1970s. And there's no reason to believe that those studies are necessarily particularly relevant today. So I think that part of you know, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is it's not so much. It is in some cases that's, that areas were addressed less well. But the main thing is if we really want to have confidence in any of these findings, and I purposely wrote them in the past tense, I wrote them in the past tense to emphasize the fact that if we really want to have confidence in these things, we can't just assume that the findings hold up in, a, in what is a very dynamic world, changing a lot in terms of demographics, changing a lot in terms of the economy of the country and the economies of locality. So it's important to press forward with further studies. I'm pleased to say that all three of the areas identified uh, are areas that, uh, that uh, the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation is pursuing. Uh, but I think it's also important even to look back at things and think about trying to replicate them where we had very, you know, we could be very confident in the findings in terms of how something would work in 1994, where I think we have to sort of wonder, would we actually get the same results in 2014? So, so Judy, I know that uh, you know MDRC was known for its experimentation and the and the difference in means from that method, but I also think you were known in the research community for something else, which was that those studies were rarely just about that difference in means, and I'm wondering if you can sort of pick up on Howard's point about both changing context, but also what else you need to you need to be aware of when you do these studies. <coughs> yeah, I, Howard's summary is terrific. Um, and, and I'd add that, you know, what he's talking about is the great progress <coughs> that was made in learning, on average, whether these programs cause change. That's a triumph of science. But we've made only limited pro progress, and not through a lack of effort in dissecting the factors that contribute to program success. And as a result, I think we don't know enough about how to replicate or improve programs to make them more effective. And in all of these studies, there were persistent efforts to try to look at statistically or through various kinds of implementation and even ethnographic research, what were the nature of these programs. Because what we learned was that impacts often varied across offices, for example. And um, when you look at multi-site studies, I mean, I, I emphasized earlier that results were replicated over different states, but there's also a lot of variation. What explains it? How can we make programs better? The findings that Howard cited and that I saluted earlier basically are about progress. Um, 
findings that are modest in scale. Can we ratchet those up? Can we make them larger? What would it take to do that? How can we improve programs? So there's a real effort now going on to try to look at what explains variation and impact across sites. Um, I, I'm, I don't know whether that methodological effort, looking at all of the experiments that are out there and trying to look at ones that are in many locations and figure out really rigorously what explains success. The other thing that I would stress in thinking about what remains to be done is making random assignment a more useful management tool for you. Um, studies take time, uh, sometimes because you have to follow people for years to know whether they succeed and sometimes follow thousands of people. But you have questions that are very pressing now. And you are every day testing out new things. I would urge you to run little experiments. Um, I'm very intrigued by um, behavioral economics trying to combine psychology and economics to redesign everything from forms and letters and all the procedures that you do all the time. If Walmart can test the results experimentally of what the difference is if you put uh, ladies' underwear in the front of the office or men's shirts or whatever, the store, they do that all the time using experiments. You can do it too. Uh, it doesn't take a lot, and the use of administrative records to ta track people um, gives you a powerful tool. So get involved with people who will help you do that. The other area where I'd really like to see progress is um, that right now uh, th th there's um, a real dichotomy between what experiments show and what performance measures and the whole performance management movement suggests. And that's not very useful. These are two different strategies that have as a goal improving results. They, they really go in different directions right now. And I think one of the challenges of the future is, try, is to try to understand ways that these two kinds of information can reinforce each other. Right now, they don't, and they push in different directions. So Don, as someone who is like on, on the front line and, and, and actually sort of one, I felt, seems like one foot in, one foot out of this uh, experimenting at the local level. What? Like two points, I think. Well, first of all, in, in terms of one of the points that Judy said about uh, you know, smaller scale, but there, there's also been, there was a uh, part of this conference was on uh, rapid cycle uh, evaluations and, and other techniques. One of the, the lessons that I learned from the project independence evaluation was it was very frustrating for uh, to being this large evaluation and to find out the impacts five years later. Uh, as, an, as an operational tool, that was really limiting because the, the life cycle of major research studies and the life cycle of policy change are out of sync. Uh, states typically don't wait five years to change things. You, uh, it, you know, every, every two years there's a new class of legislators and they want to change things now. Uh, so one of the things that we did with the family transition uh, program was we developed a database so that the, and the, the field offices that were involved had no knowledge or, uh, about this, but uh, in, in our uh, headquarters office we had a, a, a team and one of the things we were tracking was the administrative data on a month-by-month -month basis for the folks who had been randomly assigned. So we knew in near real time what, uh, how things were trending so that when it was time to make some important program decisions, we didn't have the formal evaluation uh, impacts, but we, we knew uh, the, the basic uh, information about that. So having that capability to, to really know on a, uh, a more abbreviated time scale was very important. The other thing I'd like to, to stress is that while random assignment evaluations are important and irreplaceable, really, in terms of answering the impact question of, you know, what was the difference uh, attributed to the program, they're not very good at telling you why. 
And the why question is critically important for people who are administering programs. So I think one of the things that, that certainly MDRC did uh, and others that do this research uh, pay a lot of attention to are implementation studies, the study of in addition to what are the impacts, the more context question about why things are different. There's a, at least when I was uh, a state administrator, I sometimes found myself uh, having the, the kind of illusion that when a, a memo came across my desk and I signed off on a policy change that somehow within a couple of weeks by magic it would be implemented uh, all over the state. <laughs> and, and I was often disappointed to find out that, that you know, somebody hadn't read the memo uh, after a while. <laughs> and, uh, so that question of to what extent is your implementation faithful to your program design is a critically important question. And the implementation study really helps get at that because if there are not any differences between the, the program group and the control group, it may be because the program treatment didn't work or it may be that nobody actually implemented the program treatment. And that's a really important uh, part of the story. And I think as we go to using more rapid cycle use of administrative data uh, and maybe some smaller scale uh, studies, it's still going to be important to keep that context information uh, and the implementation information available uh, to help tease out the why of the observed differences. So, Ron, did you want to weigh in on this or want to move on? Let's move on. Move on. Okay. So, today, I mean, we've sort of slipped into the world today is a little different than the world 40 years ago when this train started. Um, so, where, where do, to what extent are these lessons sort of applicable today, and how do we, how do we make that determination? Well, I think there are three huge lessons that we're likely to overlook because they're so, they're so major. The first one is that policymakers will pay attention, not that they'll read the studies, but that you can, as I described, this atmosphere can really have an impact on policymaking. And we have lots of areas now that are equally as controversial, maybe not equally, but are very controversial. I'm thinking especially of birth control now, which is extremely controversial. And we now have good evidence. I think I wish we had more random assignment evidence. But we know a lot of thing about uh, uh, long-acting reversible birth control. They could really make a huge difference in our non-marital birth rates. We have a tr tremendous success with teenagers, but we could do the same thing with 20-somethings. And that's where the problem is the most important. And we, if we gave unlimited access and, and counseled people correctly, we could really reduce the non-marital birth rate, which have immediate effect on poverty and I think a long-term effect as, as well. So policymakers will listen to evidence. That's, the, that's by far the broadest lesson. Um, the second thing that we learned that also has not been applied as wisely as it should is that poor mothers will work. If you arrange programs to help them work and encourage them to work, help them find work and support them, that they will work at high rates. And we, uh, why we have not applied these principles in food stamps, in housing, uh, even perhaps in Medicaid, I think they should be much more broadly applied. That's very controversial on the Hill, but I think that's the second thing. Uh, that's uh, extremely important. Um, and now we have lots of new questions. They've been suggested here. Howard brought it up first. But I think with the questions about the role of education and training is really important. There's a feeling in a, the whole country, I think, but uh, including in the Congress, that education programs are the best. And one of the flaws in welfare reform is it, it actually uh, reduced the chance to use education. And that was there's still an argument over this about the extent to which education would help. Howard said in long-term results there are, like the Baltimore study, uh, that there's evidence that an education training component will work. But now we have huge questions uh, because the economy's changed so much, also as Howard pointed out, that a lot of job, if, if someone's going to make 40,000 a year, that should be, we should have that in mind. We want more people to make 40,000 a year. They're going to have to have skills. And how we give them those skills is really a big question. And that, if we applied the lessons of welfare reform there with random assignment experiments of one-year programs, six-month programs, uh, Bob Lerman is he here? Uh, we, we should have. Uh, he's we should, here. He's here. 
What, what else should we have, Bob? Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Um, so we, I think that these lessons about how to get people to earn more money, even when they've had a lousy high school education, and especially how we could incorporate our community colleges. And we have, a, we have experiments like that going on now. The administration has been very big on that, and they funded, I think they have over a billion dollars to fund experiments like that. The results are not in yet. But those are big questions that would profit in the same way that welfare reform did. So what, but how does a policymaker or a practitioner know when you pick up a study um, whether this, whether this is relevant to those questions. I mean, there are studies out there that sort of say, yeah, education works, but, um, and you can see the treatment control difference, but if you're sitting out in the field um, or sitting up on the hill, how, are we making smart judgments about whether this study is the one that is supportive of my a particular policy or practice? And yeah. Um, I think here, knowledge of the way things actually happen on the Hill, and maybe in some states as well, is really important. The way things actually happen on the Hill, I think there are two really important considerations. One is Congressional Budget Office, Congressional Research Service, General Accounting Office, if, what, that's not its name anymore, it's still GAO, but something else. Uh, anyway, these organizations are really important because Members of Congress actually listen sometimes, but especially staff members. So they're kind of a filter. And the, the, I often describe the people at the Congressional Research Service as full professors without the attitude. In other words, they really, really know their stuff. Uh, and they are often asked to testify, but even more importantly, behind the scenes, many staffers on the Hill talk to them and they play a very important role. So they're the ones that can say, this is really valuable information, it's correct, and so forth. That's a, and the Congress trusts them because they're a creature of the Congress and not part of the administration. <clears throat> so that's one answer. A second answer is that I think the research, big research companies like MDRC, Mathematica app, have gotten very good at making their information available, briefing people on the Hill, having meetings, that's another source of policymakers to find out, again, primarily through their staffs, although occasionally policymakers will come to something like that, but mostly it's through their staffs. And that's another valuable lesson that I think began, or at least in my experience with welfare reform, that the big companies really wanted to help policymakers, and they devised ways, and they hired people who were good at that. Uh, and and many researchers that actually were the ones down there doing the research and understood the research design and statistics could come up to the Hill and give, you know, a nice five-minute talk uh, and organize a, a, a seminar. So the, I think those are the ways that the, this information gets translated from the researchers themselves, either directly through these kind of events on the Hill or through the Congressional Research Service, Congressional Budget Office, and so forth. So, Don, did you want to add something? Well, I'll just say, and, and I think it's, it's a particular challenge uh, in, 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 at the state level uh, because there's nobody in the Florida legislature today uh, and have, haven't been for in any number of years who were involved in these discussions uh, in the early 90s and uh, to the mid-90s. And I think that there is a, a kind of a generational shift as, as, uh, as people who are as old as Ron Haskins uh, reach uh, retirement or, or leave government that, uh, and folks coming along, I, I would say to the, to the next generation of uh, agency administrators, many of whom are, are sitting in this room, you have a responsibility to learn this stuff and to know this history, it's as important to know this history as it is to know all of the practice issues you have to know that are important to the programs that you administer because you don't want to take the time for your policy uh, heads, your agency heads and your, your legislators and governor's office people to have to completely relearn these lessons by repeating them. And in every uh, state and, and local jurisdiction, there are knowledge intermediaries uh, that include the, the policy folks in the agencies, they include the governor's staff, they include legislative staff, and the kind of the, the state level uh, 
kind of uh, people like uh, CRS and GAO uh, folks uh, who are involved in these discussions, and it's really important uh, to know what's happened in the past so you can move forward uh, in terms of applying those lessons in new ways in the future. And while I think that a lot of the organizations that, uh, uh, that Ron mentioned uh, can be very helpful uh, in helping to guide that, it's important that when your policymakers in the state and county look to you to know the answers that, that you're well grounded uh, in this history. Howard, yeah. Yeah, I, I would like to emphasize you know, and add another aspect to this, uh, which is a, a general point. It's not just about welfare research, but it applies to welfare research. And that's that what gave these set of studies so much power was their volume and the coherence in which uh, they eventually came together. That they really ended up, although we didn't envision this at the beginning, creating an agenda, an agenda of studies where one set of studies led to another set of studies, what we learned in an earlier set we were applied to a later set, uh, created the impetus for others. And we've seen a really huge explosion in the use of random assignment, uh, especially in the last you know, decade. But I think part of what's critical about it is that as powerful as any particular study is, and individual studies can be very powerful, that what really creates the ability to influence uh, programs to operate at higher levels and influences policymakers is an agenda of studies, a coherent body of work uh, that leads to subsequent work and that's what I think really creates credibility. And that's what I think we all need to really be striving for and that practitioners and policymakers should be looking for and that those who fund research should really aim to achieve. Judy. Um, I would also add that the way the question is framed, uh, have, have lessons learned are well relevant to welfare research today. I think one of the changes is that it isn't just about welfare now. I mean, welfare is not the big program or um, the thing under attack right now, and the solutions lie, as was hinted at in the discussion here, outside of what directly goes on in welfare agencies. So that relevant to you is also the discussion about education and what works in education, which Ron mentioned. The literature on emerging successful interventions in community colleges, you ought to really take a look at that. I mean, there are some really striking results emerging from random assignment studies in community colleges where you know everyone is poor in the study and a third of them are mothers. That's the same population, just looked at through a different lens. And um, various ways of supporting uh, people who are working. So. I think um, as you look at research, you need to be thinking about the lessons from, and, and pulling in people who can integrate those lessons into the techniques and programs that you want to reach out to and encourage to occur in your communities. Okay, I think what I'm going to do is um, give you a, in the audience a heads up that we're going to move to question and answers in a little bit. But before we do that, I want to sort of pose to each of the panelists just to give you an opportunity to reflect on, um, particularly given this conversation and given where we are today, um, what, what do you think we should be focusing on moving ahead. And I'm thinking about things like, what are the questions that are uh, paramount? What do we know and not know? This, people raised, I think Don and Howard in particular, raised questions about you know, the changing landscape of data uh, that we have available, the imperative of speed of turning out information. The practitioners and the policy offices can't wait five years. Um, how do you think about you know, where we should where we should be headed um, from here. 
we want to capitalize on this 40 years and not, not, not move backwards, keep moving forward. So um, let me just start. Uh, Judy, you want to take the first? Um, well, I'd say a few things. First, this fight is not one about random assignment. This is a 40-year success story, but there are still many people who think it's too expensive, it's too slow, alternatives are just as good. Um, we know as much as we need to know, so we don't need to do research. We just got to implement what succeeds. I don't think any of those things are true, but um, the marshalling of a community of support and using it um, and having answers to those questions remains important. We call the book Fighting for Reliable Evidence. We don't declare victory at the end. I don't think that's where we are now. In moving ahead, as I said, I think um, one, the, I, I mentioned two things, and I just repeat them. I think turning random assignment, given that the fact that performance measures are not good proxies for what you get from random assignment studies, figuring out ways to use this tool, as Don was suggesting, in routine practices in your offices. Try it out. You know, when you're designing a new intake form, design two, or keep the present, or do it in some offices and choose them by, it's easy to do. You don't uh, need to turn everything into a full-fledged research study to use the power of this very simple technique. Um, and that on the research staff side, we have to keep working on the why and how questions, because um, I don't think uh, people are not satisfied with the average impacts. It's not enough. We need to learn more about how to improve programs, and there's an impatience about that in the field, and I think we have to uh, do a better job. Here's what I think I learned from the welfare form experience that I think has enormous application, and that is you could actually answer questions about whether a program would produce a certain impact. You could actually know. If you did a good experiment, you could conclude that if I do this set of things, this will happen under these circumstances. And that is, it's an amazing thing. It's way beyond correlation and multiple regression and all that. So that's, a, for, that's the heart of everything that we're trying to do now, I think. Uh, the second thing is that I think the future of random assignment uh, evidence, which is crucial, I think, the methods have to change. We cannot be launching five-year exper experiments like Don was saying. We've got to learn to do it better. Judy has said it exactly right, that administrators have to have the capacity to do things that take six months, and they can get an actual answer. They're going to have to make a decision of some kind. If we can figure out ways, especially I think administrative data is really a key here, that if we do, do not have to necessarily collect new things and can use the evidence we're already I call it evidence, but the administrative data that you're already collecting, that that will be a key part of it. We need to work on that. We had a session yesterday and talked about that. And as Judy said, this is happening in the private sector all the time. It's extremely impressive. And they run thousands, thousands of experiments in a year, not one every five years. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is I'm tempted to say, even if everybody on this panel up here tried the best that they could and rallied another 100 people behind him, they could not stop the evidence-based movement. We're, in, we're not at the beginning anymore. We're down the road, evidence-based. Members of Congress talk about it. It's, it's gotten to be a common thing that somebody wants to support a certain program. They virtually have to say it's evidence-based. So even if it's not, they make it up and say it is. Uh, but the, I, and this administration, as I, say, I said, uh, and especially also management and budget, but the agencies as well, several that I could name, uh, have really beefed up their staff, they're focused on evidence, they want to make more decisions on evidence, and they're trying to impose it on people around the country and have billions of dollars behind them uh, to actually do it. So I think we're, you know, we're in the growth phase now, and if we can make this work, we will be able to improve our public policies, and we'll actually be able, I think, to move the needle on national problems as we have on teen pregnancy, and we do the same thing with violence, do the same thing with uh, graduation rates and reading scores and so forth. We could do that. Thanks, John. A couple of things, and, and I think one of the lessons that, uh, that I just don't want to end without mentioning is that with the, the fight over random assignment that, uh, that we were involved in in Florida, 
uh, with the Florida legislature and they're looking and the information that, uh, uh, that Rob Hollister shared that was presented to the Florida uh, Senate and the, the random assignment fight was largely in the Florida House. These were complex, difficult issues that state representatives and state senators spent a lot of time trying to understand and ultimately they got it. And, and I think one of the lessons was that, uh, you know, I walked away from that discussion going, wow. Uh, you know, ultimately it, it was hard, but, but folks struggled with this very complex information and nuanced information and ultimately got it and, and made the right decisions. Uh, so I think one of the things is, is don't be afraid of, of making those complex arguments in, in that public uh, arena uh, because folks are capable of understanding it. The other thing, uh, and to pick up on Ron, what Ron said about administrative data, uh, I can remember a time, uh, younger people in the, the room won't believe this, but there once was a time when I had more questions about programs than I had data to help answer those questions. And now, people have so much more data than they could ever analyze. I mean, the world is completely flipped there, and the, uh, the access to administrative data is completely different uh, than it once was. But now I think a real challenge that we all have is how to bring that massive data together and make sense of it horizontally across programs because Families that we work with are not just influenced by this program or this program, but by a whole range of programs and understanding those relationships and teasing those out and then doing the careful research uh, to, to see what works, what works best for whom. Uh, you know, there's an extra dimension to that. But we have tools now that didn't exist back then uh, to help that sort that out. So I think one of the things going forward to build on the lessons from the past is to utilize the new analytic capability with the, the methodologies that are available to kind of take this, uh, the next step in not only answering what does this program do or what does that program do, but what do the array of uh, programs and services do taken together to influence the lives of, of the families that we're working with. Howard. Yeah, I would just uh, throw my vote behind uh, things that my colleagues have said. Uh, routinize, institutionalize, make it more common, make it more flexible, usable, use this tool in more settings. Get, get in the mode of thinking about, I had a boss who was terrific because every time a question would come up, even, you know, we didn't have the resources to do all these things, he'd think of a neat experiment that would answer that question if we only had the time and the resources. And I think that's, that's the thing to do, is to get yourself in that mode of, of thinking. The other thing I would just quickly say is, the why question is really important. And why did it work? What part of it worked? And there are a lot of experimental ways of getting that. They aren't uh, entirely uh, easy to do, and they're not entirely satisfactory in some cases. They're non-experimental ways to do it. We've practiced a variety of things. Uh, you know, in my lessons, I didn't talk about implementation, but that was just for lack of time. And you know, Judy, fortunately, and others piped in with some of that. But I think this is an area where actually people are really paying attention. And, and over the last 10 years, we've begun to make some progress in the area of really sort of understanding more than we were able to, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. We've been making progress. I mean, a lot of progress was made in the 80s, so it's not like people haven't worked at this question, but I feel that it's really uh, a place to be optimistic because I think it's moving forward. Okay, well, thank you. Let's thank our panelists, and we'll go to questions. Okay, so I'm going to... Yes, there are microphones. Um, there's one over uh, on each side of the room. I'm going to ask you to please line up behind the microphones. Uh, and um, I, if you would please, um, when I call on you, state your name and affiliation. And please, um, be, 
so that, that we have opportunities for um, everyone who wants to raise questions to do so and our panelists to respond. Limit yourselves to the questions, not comments, and, and one per speaker. Um, do we have any from, the, uh, from our outside listeners? No. Okay, so we will start with, let's start over here. Hello, uh, my name is Mariana Chilton. I'm an associate professor at Drexel University School of Public Health, and I'm getting ready to start my first randomized controlled trial on Monday. So this was a very relevant, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. This is a very relevant panel discussion. Thank you very much. I have just one comment that leads to my question. Um, I have to say that I'm so appreciative of the comments about the importance of understanding context and of the why. Um, and I'd have to say that for my work in the ghetto of Philadelphia and also in Baltimore, Camden, and Boston, there is so much heterogeneity in the TANF programs um, in each, where we are working, not only by state, but also by county and also by county assistance office. So I really just wanted to give a plug for those of us who are, I'm an epidemiologist and an anthropologist. If you want to do a randomized controlled trial and understand the context and how to scale up and understand the why, you need to collaborate with anthropologists and other kinds of qualitative researchers that can see, that can give you information about the context and the heterogeneity. My question is, being a researcher from the outside, really someone who is not a member of the, um, as you would refer to them as corporations, APT, Mathematica, MDRC, the large research organizations, um, or um, Agency for Children and Families, how does someone like me and the other researchers that understand context and also have excellent methods of epidemiology and are willing to run, run randomized controlled trials, how do we get into the funding mechanisms of the Agency for Children and Families? And what sort of what is our onboarding process so that we can join you and join the cause? Gee, I'm not uh, sure which of us up here can uh, uh, I uh, Mark, uh, does anybody from ACF want to take that question? <laughs> or would somebody here, I think Judy. I, I guess what I'd say is that in almost all of these studies that I've been involved in, there have been collaborators from academia um, who brought special expertise to the study. So I think there's lots of opportunities uh, to work with these firms who have reached out to all the disciplines you mentioned. Um, in uh, designing and conducting those studies. So that's, that's one way to do it. I, I would say I don't think you can do many of these large studies as a solo practitioner in a university. That's, that's I, I want to make one other point that hasn't been made so far. The power of this research is not just the agenda that Howard mentioned. It's that they aren't a group of one-off studies. One here on a topic, scattershot sort of. It, th they are they are replicated in multiple locations. That's very important, because the so one study that you do out there, it can get someone a PhD, but it's not going to influence policy on its own. It's got to get, you've got to have some traction and, and replicate studies. And another thing <coughs> of the power of what's going on now is the opportunity for synthesis. Once you build up a volume of studies, you then have a whole industry of people who can pull those results together across studies, and that's an, a tremendous leverage. Yeah, I, I would just echo what Judy said throughout, but uh, I think we're always interested in, in collaborating with others. I'd be glad to exchange cards with you. Okay, so let's go over here, John, on the right. Hi, I'm uh, George Cave. I'm with Summit Consulting here in D.C. But uh, I worked for Judy for a number of years uh, at MDRC, mainly, though, in the uh, youth development area. My question is about uh, remaining questions about uh, workfare. And uh, I heard Howard say that one of the things we've learned is that uh, job search was often combined with something else. And uh, I would uh, add that that, uh, so that something else always included uh, or else, go to job club or you will be uh, deemed non-compliant and you will lose at least part of your already meager uh, uh, welfare grant. And uh, so the question is, to what extent are the, uh, is the job search help responsible for people getting off the rolls and getting jobs? Uh, and to what extent is the fear that they felt when they got the notice 
responsible for their leaving welfare. MDRC actually did an experiment to address this question, and the results are still on the website. The paper is called Do Mandates Matter? And uh, it was found that uh, when the people who were called in for a mandatory orientation were sent home with no further obligation, the impacts on uh, welfare receipt and earnings were just about the same as the impacts of uh, the full program. Um, do you think that uh, that experiment answered that question, or uh, uh, does further work still remain to be done to answer that question? To what extent is the uh, um, modest help that people get with job finding responsible for the savings, and to what extent is the fear that they may have felt uh, when they got the notice responsible. Now, um, other people have uh, looked at this issue in other programs, and uh, a simple way to get at this uh, through implementation analysis is to uh, keep track of, of, of when people get their notices and when they're scheduled to report and finish Job Club, and to see whether they leave, tend to leave welfare uh, en masse early when they get the notice or late when they uh, finish Job Club. So thank you. Let's, uh, Howard, do you want to answer that? Oh, I, I, I would start. I, I, would th I, I don't think in welfare, per se, there is a lot of evidence. There's a study that you mentioned. I read the study as saying both. The services matter and the mandate matters. And, uh, and I, plus, I think we have other experience that suggests that the services matter, too, when sort of when it came after the mandate, when people were randomly signed afterwards. But I think it is a question that is not necessarily directly uh, critical, because I think there is a lot of evidence that the services matter. Um, and as far as I can see, there's not a lot of appetite within TANF for voluntary uh, job search. I think it's much more typically mandatory. So I think the question that's more critical is, which forms of job search actually, you know, add more than others. Um, there, is a, there is a big research on the unemployment insurance side which says that the mandate is very important, at least for that population. Uh, and in some cases it shows that is what makes the difference. I think with respect to research, there's good evidence that both matter. Okay, let's go over here. Thank you, Howard. Be Becca, can I oh, have oh, just yes. one, one thought on that? And, and you know, first of all, uh, those who would like to help tease out what some of those uh, strategies are are in luck because uh, ACF uh, now uh, is working on a, uh, an evaluation that uh, APT and, and Mathematica and others are involved in called the, uh, um, the Job Search, uh, uh, JSA, uh, Job Search Activities. Uh, evaluation that there was a workshop on. So, you know, there's plenty of room uh, to help tease out exactly <coughs> what job search strategies work best uh, for others. The other thing, though, that was just an interesting uh, fact that we, we found in the family transition uh, evaluation, as, as folks came into the random assignment process, MDRC gave everybody a uh, a survey form to fill out uh, a BIF, a background information form. Judy remembers the BIF. And one question was, do you want to work? And almost everybody said yes. And another question was, and how many jobs have you applied for in the last 30 days? <laughs> and the uh, response was not so much. And uh, so I, I think that, you know, one of the things you can tease out is, and, and one of the things with the mandate is then when we looked at differences, uh, control to experimental, is that people subject to the mandate were much more likely to actually participate uh, in, in those activities uh, that led to employment. Thank you. Um, let's go over here. Yeah, hi, Bob Lerman. Um, quick point. Uh, on history, uh, academics were behind the negative income tax experiments, and those were very experimentally based. But moving forward, uh, it seems to me that uh, one of the strategies is to, we're, we're always looking at the individual, which is important, but we're not looking at things like employers 
and we don't really do a whole lot of analysis of how employers behave, how you change that behavior. So that's one thing I think going forward, more studies on employers themselves. <clears throat> Second thing which I think we haven't really teased out very well is the joint impact of all these financial incentives of all the programs taken together and the impact on uh, individuals um, and uh, not uh, both on work and on marriage. Anybody want to comment on that? I, I, okay, well, let's, uh, I, let's go over here and get your question. Hi, my name is Wilson Segura from Riverside County in California, uh, social services. Uh, my question is, well, first I would like to start by saying that um, I'm a true believer of experiments and uh, random assignment, and I think uh, it is the best way to show causation. However, my question is, um, I also think that there are other tools that we should be bringing into research. So I would like to talk about some of those. And, uh, you know, as you were presenting, one of the examples that came to mind was uh, research in uh, smoking and cancer. So some of the studies um, developed as correlational studies or as showing association and because it was very difficult to do experiments on showing that someone who smokes uh, gets cancer because of uh, cigarettes. So that's one instance where I see that experiments might not be 100% um, applicable in, uh, in that situation. Um, granted, there were some experiments in, in that area, but also correlational research was very useful for seeing um, how smoking um, impacts cancer. The second area that came to mind uh, was, you know, for instance, let's say I have a funder who says, I, wanna, I want you to examine this program within eight months after implementation. One of the problems is that some programs take time to develop, so to show effects. So based on the literature, you might see that the program, you're going to see cost and effect within two years, three years, because it takes time for that program to actually um, cause an effect, uh, to have an effect. So in, in that instance, I would say, if you try to do a, um, random assignment in an experiment, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot because you, you, you're gonna show that there's no causation. So basically, you know, what you would wanna do, I think, is would be uh, do a regression study possibly and then show, okay, there is some, some association, but we need more time to show cause and effect. And the third area where I was thinking, well, you know, I think experiments are, are great, but the, the third area where I thought they might not, not be as applicable is Let's say there's a possibility that the program that you're implementing, it's not powerful enough to actually show, you know, um, show cost and effect. So it's not costing someone to get a job. But what you might find is that the, the program is influential in helping someone to get a job. But another thing you might see is that, let's say you do a multi-level analysis, you see that there's nesting effects within um, communities. So for instance, someone who comes from a community that doesn't have many resources, uh, doesn't succeed in the program, but someone who comes from another community who maybe has other resources such as reliable transportation to get to their job, you'll find that they succeed in the program. So that's one area where I would say, uh, you know, association will be very powerful for showing, okay, the program doesn't cost it, but it actually is very beneficial. So having, s you know, stated that I think um, experiments are the best way to show cost and effect, what is the role of other tools such as regression, multi-level analysis, in showing uh, credible evidence in your opinion? So, so I wanna, um, I guess, exercise the, the chair's prerogative. You've asked sort of a lot of really important questions there and, um, and, and we're sort of a, a little bit short on time. So let me make a statement and I'll give the panel a chance to, if they want, to add anything. I would um, you know, uh, refer you to a, a recent document that was uh, put out by the Institute of Education Sciences and NSF, which actually talks about the, the progression of research from, uh, from basic science to, uh, to um, development, of, of new ideas to testing of those new ideas in different settings and talks about the roles of these different genres of research in that process. And I think that uh, it, the reason I'm sort of, um, I think it would take us a very long time to fully um, and responsibly answer your question, but I think this really does help. I think we've made a lot of progress in sorting 
out what is the place of different types of research. When is it useful to do correlational research? How does that feed into the process of understanding problems and where does uh, uh, work like experimental research fit in and what does that, how does that relate to program maturity and the like. So, um, you know, I think that you've raised really good questions. Um, I think it would take us a very long time to answer. So if they, unless a panel. I'll just make one just quick comment. Your comment about the funder who wanted the results in eight months reminded me of a saying that a, uh, a former colleague of mine used to say at moments like that is if you want it bad, you get it bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good, uh, good point. Uh, so, uh, so I'm going to uh, give the last question um, over here, uh, and I guess it's the, the the left as you're looking forward, um, because we are really out of time. So, you get the last one. Oh, nice. Um, hi, my name is Yuan Fu. Um, I'm an intern with the OMB and also a graduate student at the University of Virginia Frank uh, Batten uh, School of Leadership and Public Policy. And so building reliable evidence and you know, using that to inform policy is really relevant to me and my peers right now. Um, and my question has to do with the actual reliability of the evidence. So Daniel Monahan says that you're entitled to your own opinions, but not your own facts. Um, but it seems like that as a number of research institutions and you know, think tanks rise, that might not be necessarily true. And so what I mean by that is with the same set of data, if you analyze it in slightly different ways, and I'm not talking about fudging the numbers, I'm saying like using slightly different cutoff points, you can draw very different conclusions. And so my question is, how do you guarantee that you know, we're drawing truly nonpartisan conclusions from this evidence so we can actually inform policy well? And as a follow-up to that, um, is there, should the burden be on the analysts who are you know, writing the papers? Um, to actively be nonpartisan, or should the burden be on the reader to have you know, enough statistical literacy to be able to understand the data behind it? So I'm going to give this one to Judy, because I think you, uh, they, so I think the, the question is, how do, you, how do you protect against fudging numbers or mediate differences in impact estimates when you have an experiment? Look, I always fear that as more and more people do experiments, this gold standard will get debased, you know, and all that glitters is not, in fact, gold. Um, I think we have been largely protected from that, and that the people there, the community of people who have done these experiments share a value of not becoming advocates for policy and not turning research into advocacy research but in fact letting the chips fall where they fall. Um, so I do not see that there was lots of difference in interpretation of the evidence. I think there is lots of difference in the goals that people hold for policy. I mean, people give primacy to reducing poverty. People give primacy to reducing dependency. That's a different question. So um, the, the key, it, it, we really have to make sure that random assignment studies retain their quality and do not become subject to the, the death through a million cuts and, and therefore um, the kind of debate about methodology that Don Winstead so eloquently stated. Anybody else want to weigh in on this one? This is like a really important question. So I think what, what uh, I've been hearing from the panel, my own experience is that one of the, uh, one of the best features of experiments is it is not, um, we, we don't see this kind of variability in the results. If we have a well done experiment, the, the answer is what the answer is and, and the different analysts are going to generally reproduce the same finding. So let's thank our panelists. This has been a very stimulating conversation. Um, great end to the conference. So,